Willowdale PC family. Thank you so much for joining us online today. So I want to encourage you to worship God with everything that you have.
salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the
Jesus, that we have victory in you, oh God. Lord, that we find our truth in you, we find our strength in you, oh God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that no matter what our circumstances today, Lord, we find our victory, we find our hope, we find our salvation, we find our, our sustenance, Lord. We find that you sustain us, oh God. We, we love you. Everything we have comes from you. So, Father, we sing this song today and say that I'm going to see a victory, oh God. 
You've already provided the victory, Lord, but we're going to see eternity with you. We're going to see victory in our individual circumstances. We're going to see your strength in times, oh God, when we feel like we don't have any strength. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you come in power in our lives through the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just welcome you to do so. We love you. We honor you. We bless you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. As we have already worshipped in our singing at Willowdale PC, we also worship through our giving. And we want to give you an opportunity to keep giving to the cause of God. Online giving is available, and it's really easier than ever to do. Just go to our website, willowdalepc.com, and click on the Giving tab in the right-hand side. And under Push Pay, click Give Here, and you can give any amount. Just follow the simple instructions to give. It'll take you less than two minutes, and it's a very secure way to make your donation. For those who don't have access to the internet, please share with them that they can drop off their tithes and offerings here at the church in the office mail slot by the front door. God bless you, and thank you for your faithful giving. Yvonne, I work with the Youth and Children's Ministry, and I'm here with your announcements for this week. So let's get right into it. Parents and kids, we have something brand new for you. We have Treehouse Adventures that starts this Wednesday at 6 p.m. For more information, make sure you visit us on our website to register your kids, and we can't wait to hang out with you. We know how hard it's been to not connect with people during COVID, and so we're very excited that our connect groups are starting up again the first week of February. This is gonna be a great way to hang out with other people, to have some relationship conversations, and to have some Bible studies. So make sure that you check our website for all the connect groups that are available, and we cannot wait to see you sign up, and we'll see you there. Prayer is an important part of our walk with God, and so we invite you to join us every Friday at 10 a.m. on Zoom. Make sure that you check our website for more information, and we look forward to just being with you and just lifting each other in prayer. See you there. We are so excited that you're joining us for church, and we look forward to seeing you every Sunday at 5 p.m. on our website, our Facebook, and our YouTube. And that is all the announcements we have for you this morning. So let's prepare our hearts to hear from God's word today. Before we jump in uh, to the word together this morning, I just want to thank the pastors and the leadership here at Willowdale PC uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to come and share uh, from God's word with you today. Uh, as I took time to pray about what to share, I felt that the Holy Spirit was just leading me uh, to an area that's in my life that is uh, constantly needing to be addressed and, and have attention brought to. Uh, the scripture that I want to unpack today is found in Luke chapter 10, verses uh, 25 through 37. And the topic is compassion. Authentic followers of Christ are called to compassion. My wife, Melly and I, we've been married for 13 and a half years, and we have three kids. My daughter, Cambria, is uh, 10 years old. My middle son, Jack, is 8 years old. And my little guy, Elliot, is is six years old, and we absolutely love our kids. But before we started having kids, let me just say that life was different. If you came over to the house, you would realize that our house was always clean. Our furniture was, was new, and it was in great condition. Our chairs weren't held together with uh, extra glue and clamps. Nothing in our house was stained, everything was organized, our walls didn't have any marker on them, and probably the thing I miss the most about not having kids is being able to drive a brand new vehicle, and which we drove was a Volkswagen Jetta. 
And so here's the story. I'm pastoring up in northern Ontario in the middle of the woods in Marathon, and I'm sitting inside my vehicle in the Extra Foods parking lot. It's about midday, the sun was shining bright, and I'm just loving the air condition, enjoying my A&W lunch, and then all of a sudden, I felt and heard this knock on the driver's window, and I unrolled it, and the question that came out of the stranger's mouth was probably a question that all of us have heard asked before. And the question was, excuse me, can you please give my car battery a boost? It's died. Now, how many of us have been there before? I have to plead ignorance, though, because I'm not a car guy. I actually have to rely on gauges to tell me when my tire pressure is low. And so because I didn't actually know where my car battery was located under the hood, because I didn't want to admit it to this poor guy and and embarrass myself, because I didn't really care enough about the guy that was stranded Because I didn't have compassion, I actually said to the stranger, I'm really sorry, but I'm in a rush to get home. And so I put my keys in my ignition and I started it and I drove off. Now, I know you would expect more coming from a pastor. I I, I know that it's not one of my finer moments in life, but don't worry. The Lord actually dealt with me big time on this because it was only two days later Guess who found themselves in the exact same parking lot, in the exact same situation, knocking on strangers' vehicles to get a battery boost? Well, it was this guy right here. See, I told that story with us this morning because a lot of the time, this is a very real reflection on where we're at. See, we say that we care, but we only really care about ourselves, Like when when people come to us and and they need help, when people reach out to us, a a lot of the time we have these questions and conversations in our head that, that goes like this. We ask ourselves questions like, what is in it for me? Or, or what is it going to cost me? How will this benefit me? And of course, the common denominator in all those you know, conversations that we have is me. And, and to this day, I, you know, I, I often wonder you know, what, what, what would have happened or what could have happened had I actually uh, just given this stranger a simple battery boost. And the truth is, is I have to go to bed every night not knowing if that was like an encounter that the Lord had planned for me and, and I just failed in that area. And so this morning, Willowdale, I, I want us to, if we're taking notes, just, just write this at the top of your page. Just, this is a key thought. It's to, it, to say we have compassion and not act is to not have compassion at all. See, the biggest misunderstanding around compassion is that we think compassion is a feeling, but compassion isn't a feeling. Compassion is an action. In the Greek, the word is splachnizomai. Now, good luck trying to say that one out. I said it in the mirror a few times before preaching this morning, but let's try it again. Splak needs zomai. That's the hardest Greek word I know. And, and it actually is a derivative of the word splagnon. Now, splagnon means your bowels. So splak needs zomai means your bowels are moving or bowels that move. See, the biblical understanding of compassion is to ache so much on the inside that we are compelled to action. It's, um, it's that visceral gut feeling that, that makes us move quickly. If I'm going to quote 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, it says that if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, well, how can the love of God be in that person? In the Greek, pity and compassion are the exact same word. Have you ever read 1 John 3, 4 in the King James Version? It it, it reads it like this. But but whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up thy bowels of compassion from them, how dwelleth the love of God in him? See, in their culture, if the boy, you know, loved the girl, he would never say to her, sweetheart, I love you with all of my heart. 
If a Hebrew boy went to a girl and said, I love you with all my heart, the Hebrew girl would be creeped out. She would be going to her girlfriends and they would say, hey, how was the date last night? And she would be saying, oh my gosh, he told me he loved me with that weird beating organ that lives inside of his chest cavity. It was a really weird and awkward date. See, in their culture, when you love the girl, you would never say, I love you with all my heart. You would tell the girl, I love you with all of my bowels. Why? Because life came from the bowel area. When, when the biblical writers use the word like splak nizomai and splak non, what they're literally saying is this isn't about sitting down. This is actually about getting up off of the couch and going and doing something about it. See, compassion leads the way to action. I just want to walk us through some famous gospel uh, stories this morning. In Matthew 14, 14, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, the word of God says that he had compassion on them, and then he healed their sick. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 34, Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately they received their eyesight and followed him. In, in Mark chapter 6, verse 34, when Jesus landed and he saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so what did he do? He began teaching them many things. Authentic followers of Christ are called to compassion. And to say we have compassion and not act is to not have any compassion at all. And so this is where we get to the story about the parable of, of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10 and in, in the text that we're going to read today. Uh, picking up in, in verse 25, it says that on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Now a question, who's the expert in the law? The expert in the law is a Pharisee. And, we, and he said, teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now we've all asked this question at some point in our lives. And when this Pharisee asked Jesus this question, Jesus' full response was given through what we call a parable. Now before we get too deep into this, we need, we need to understand that, that rabbis often taught in parables, and, and it wasn't just a story to kind of get their point across. When, when, when rabbis taught in parables, it often involved three different people or objects or circumstances. Because in Hebrew culture, parables are never shared for the content. They are always shared for identification. And so, so when Jesus or any other famous rabbis of his day, like Rabbi Hillel or Rabbi Shammai, when we read their writings and when they teach and they, they, they explain things in parables, uh, it, it was never for content. It was always for identification. And their listeners were always sitting there listening and asking themselves, well, who am I in the story? Am I the lost sheep? Am I the lost coin? Or am I the lost son? Am I the guy that got, you know, two bags of gold or three bags of gold? Or am I the guy that got five bags of gold? When Jesus is telling the story, uh, he, am I the, the foolish virgin? Am I, am I the wise virgin, uh, virgin? Am I the guy that went to work half the day and got paid? Or am I the guy that went to work for the whole day and got paid? See, parables were meant to help us understand who we are and if we subscribe to kingdom principles or not. And this is an amazing exercise for reading everything in the Bible. I don't care where you're at in your devotional life this morning. Open the Bible and ask yourselves those questions. Who am I when you're reading those stories? When it, when it comes to things like our decision making, are, are we deceived like Eve or are we selfish like Adam? When it, when it comes to our personal witness, are, are we going to stand strong like Noah or are we going to try to get a free ticket like the rest of his family did? When it comes to things like repentance, are we going to be like the thief on the cross to the right of Jesus? Or are we going to be like the thief on the cross to the left of Jesus? Where do we see ourselves in the parable of the Good Samaritan? Verse 26, what is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. 
Very interesting what Jesus said there. He said when we love God and when we love people, that's when we live. But he wanted to justify himself. And so he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? So let's remind ourselves of just a a, a few things before we move forward. Who's asking the question? It's the Pharisee. Who's answering the question? It's Jesus. And how is Jesus answering the question? He's answering the question through a parable, which means the Pharisee and anybody else that's in earshot of Jesus is listening to the parable and they're trying to figure out which character in the parable that they identify with the most. And in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho where he was attacked by robbers and they stripped him of his clothes, they beat him and and, and went away, leaving him half dead. Well, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was about 27 kilometers long. It dropped in elevation by nearly 1,800 feet. It was very winding, very dangerous. And because it was such a difficult road to travel, it actually became a hot spot for thieves to hang out. And these guys like literally went Hulkamania on this poor dude. But the good news is, is that we've got a religious guy coming along, Right? Right? A priest, in verse 31, a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. The question is, is would the Pharisee, who Jesus is telling this parable to, would he have identified with the priest? And oddly enough, the answer is no. Because all of the priests were Sadducees. See, the difference between a Pharisee and a Sadducee is that Sadducees believed the Torah only. They believed that the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy was the word of God, and that's all they needed. But the Pharisees came along, and they said, hey, we believe in Torah as the word of God, but we also believe the prophets. And so as soon as Jesus said, hey, there was a priest, the Pharisee would have would have tuned him out and said to himself, oh, well... I'm not that guy in the story because that can't possibly be me. And and our tendency in reading this parable is to think, you know, shame on you. You know, bad priest, you're supposed to help the person in need. But but this isn't necessarily the case. See, the priest was was put in a position where, where he actually had to choose the lesser of two evils. Because the Torah says in, in Leviticus 15, 19, that, that you're not allowed to touch somebody uh, who's bleeding out. But to the Torah also says in Leviticus 19, 16, that you can't leave somebody for dead. So it doesn't matter what this priest does, he is going to sin. He is going to break one of the rules. But it doesn't necessarily mean that he's a bad priest. Like, just put yourselves in his sandals for a minute. What if the priest was having a bad day? Have you ever seen somebody in need and and you were having a bad day and and we just decided, oh, now is not the time to deal with this? What if if the priest in that moment was was dealing with his own problems, with with his own issues in his life? What if he's walking along the road, but his wife texted him that he better not be home late for dinner? And if he stopped to help this poor guy, there's going to be a whole lot more problems at home to deal with. Or what if the priest knew about the road, knew about this place as a hot spot for thieves and robbers, and thought, hey, maybe this is just a decoy to get me to pull over, and if I get pulled over, then my life's going to be in danger, and they're going to leave me beaten up and left for dead beside of the road. See, this is what the, the priest had to wrestle with in this story. And then in verse 32, we pick it up again. So too, a Levite... When he came to the place and saw him, he did the same thing. The word of God says that he passed by on the other side of the road. Now the question, would the Pharisee who's listening to this parable identify with the Levite? And the answer is no, for the exact same reason. Levites were Sadducees. They came from the same place. So once again, was he a bad Levite? No. I mean, maybe the yoke of his rabbi taught him that that it's just best to not touch somebody who's bleeding out. Because the truth is, is is we as the church, we, we have to own this today. We will always have an excuse that justifies us not acting with compassion. 
And so when we hear of people's needs, and there's a lot of them these days, we, we need to be ready for those conversations to take place in our heads. And the conversations sound a lot like this. Oh man, I'm running late. Or, or I don't even know these people. This, this sounds like the start to a bad horror movie. Or, or if I don't get home, I'm going to have my own issues. This thing, if I give a little bit of time, it could end up taking all day. It will be long and drawn out. This, this thing could cost me something if I pulled over. We, we say things all the time like, I could help them now, but what if later on they turn out to be needy and annoying? Or we say things like, I could help them now, but what if they don't learn from this and then they find themselves in the exact same situation a couple months later, then what are we going to do? And if they don't learn the lesson through me helping them now, does that mean that I'm actually making any difference in doing that? See, we need to write this down in our notes as well. Compassion interrupts and compassion costs. The only time when it does it is when we wake up in the morning and intentionally pray and pray throughout their day things that say like, Lord, give me the courage to see things differently and then give me the irresistible urge to respond to the things that I see. Because the truth is, God loves to interrupt our schedules. God loves to bring about divine encounters in our lives. He loves to see us step out in faith in situations that we never planned for. He loves to to give us things that we didn't plan for or that we weren't counting on. And the truth is, is just because we didn't put it in our phones, in our calendar, it doesn't mean that God didn't initiate that. See, in the parable, we have three characters And so if we're not the priests and we're not the Levite, then that means we have to be that third character. So the Pharisee who's listening to Jesus preach this parable, he would have been going out of his mind to find out who the third guy was. And in verse 33, Jesus says, But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And there's that word, splachnizomai. The guy that was left for dead was a Jew, and the hero was a Samaritan. See, the Jews completely despised and loathed Samaritans. Since Samaritans were were half Jewish and half Gentile, they were often considered as half-breeds. They were looked at as worse than dogs. And there are documented stories of a Jewish person who would travel around an entire city and take an extra day's journey just to avoid bumping into a Samaritan on the street. Yet it was the Samaritan man who had compassion on his enemy. I'm going to say that again because a lot of us miss this. It was a Samaritan man who had compassion on his enemy. If there is somebody on the couch with you or in the lazy boy across the living room from you right now, turn to them and say it was the Samaritan man who had compassion on his enemy. Because here is the mind-blowing part about the gospel that rarely gets preached. Jesus said in order for us to inherit eternal life, we have to learn how to love the people that we hate the most. And he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expenses that you may have. And so I thought, let's be practical. Let, let's look at this story in our vernacular in, in a modest way. Now, we can't go out to stores right now because of this COVID-19 pandemic lockdown thing that we're going through again. So that meant I had a lot of time this week to Google and do some online shopping. And so I was able to price out a few items. And if you're taking notes, write this down. The Bible says that it cost him, the Samaritan man, his own medical supplies. 
Well, Canadian Tire sells a middle-of-the-road first aid kit for $79.99. So that's one. And then the Bible says that, that it cost him his own oil. Well, I went to Costco the other week, and I picked up oil. And for four liters, it only cost me $39.99. Then the Bible says that it cost him his own wine. Well, I don't know anything about wine, but I love watching Shark Tank, and Kevin O'Leary always says on that show that the average bottle of wine is $18. So let's just be modest, go with Kevin O'Leary's pricing here, $18 for wine. And then the Bible says that it cost him his own transportation. Well, to drive 27 kilometers in my uh, truck, it cost me about $7 in fuel. And then it cost him his time as he walked 27 kilometers to the nearest hotel. See, the route from Jerusalem to Jericho was about a day's journey under normal circumstances. But when you're walking beside a donkey that's carrying dead weight, it would have taken much, much longer. And don't forget, we're just crunching numbers here. We're trying to be modest. It's clear, though, that the Samaritan man was extremely wealthy. But let's just base this parable off of minimum wage. Today in Ontario, minimum wage is $14 an hour. And in Jesus' day, everybody worked 12 hours a day, six days a week. So that means at $14 an hour, it would have been $168 in lost wages. And then the, the, he ramped it up, and he paid the innkeeper two denarii. Well, in Jesus' day, two denarii was two days' wages, which is another $336. And what we see happening here is that the Samaritan had enough compassion. He had enough splagnizomai on his enemy that he spent $648.98 plus tax, and then told the innkeeper for, for everything else, there's MasterCard. See, Jesus said that if we want to inherit eternal life, then we must love our neighbor and be willing to do what the Samaritan man did. So the question that we have to answer today is this. Are we the priest? Are we the Levite? Or are we the good Samaritan? Or maybe a, a better way of asking the question is like this. Do we conduct ourselves in a way that if it costs us $648.98 to have compassion on our worst enemy, then so be it. See, the question should never be about how Jesus interrupts our schedule. The question is when Jesus interrupts it. And what happens when Jesus was interrupted? Well, on his way to, to heal Jairus' daughter, he was interrupted by a woman who had the issue of bleeding for 12 years. And when he was interrupted, the lady was healed and Jairus' daughter was resurrected. Right while he was sleeping in the boat, uh, his sleep was interrupted. And when his sleep was interrupted, his disciples witnessed his power and authority over the atmosphere and he calmed the winds, the waves, and the ocean. While he was out of town, he was interrupted by his sisters, Mary and Martha, and his best friend Lazarus was resurrected. While he was teaching in a home, four men interrupted his sermon by literally tearing the roof off the place and lowering their paralyzed friend right down in front of Jesus, and Jesus healed him, and then his sins were forgiven. While he was out enjoying a dinner party, he was interrupted by a prostitute who poured expensive oil on his feet and began wiping it off with her hair, and and when he was interrupted with that, and in that matter, that woman was shown love and compassion and grace, and her sins were forgiven. While he was passing through Jericho, he was interrupted by a man named Zacchaeus who was sitting up in the sycamore tree. And when Jesus was uh, interrupted on that journey, greed was broken over his life, and Zacchaeus' whole entire family partied with Jesus that night, and became saved. See, the only way for us to make our world a better place is to lead as many people to Jesus as we possibly can. And so if we set our lives up in a way that allows interruption to take place, then the people that we want to win to Jesus are going to be shown love and grace and compassion. 
And forgiveness will begin to pour out of our lives. We might even have that opportunity to pray for the sick and see them healed. We might have the opportunity to see people who are are bondage in chains and they will be delivered. I promise you that when we allow our schedules to be interrupted, we will be able to bring people closer to Jesus than they've ever been before. And maybe we'll be able to witness a few miracles every now and then. See, for Jesus, interruptions were opportunities. They were never inconvenient frustrations. And so I promise us that if we as authentic followers of Jesus wouldn't be in such a rush, then there would be something. It might be that that person at work who's going through cancer and needs somebody to pray for them. And that somebody is you. It might be someone whose wife just walked out on them and they're devastated and they don't know where to turn. It might be someone who got kicked out of their apartment because they weren't able to make the rent for that month. And God will bless us with the opportunity to show them compassion. He loves to interrupt our schedules. And he loves it when we open up our splackmans. And yet here I was years ago, not even willing to get out of my car, lift the hood, and move a piece of plastic to give a stranger's car a battery boost. And there's too many people in the church today who just choose to put the key in the ignition and put it in drive and keep on going. So what kind of church is Willowdale PC going to be? When, when, when we leave our homes, when we're out in our communities, when, when we go to our school, when we go to work, what kind of people are we going to be? If Willowdale PC is our church, whether that's in person or whether that is online, if we represent God through this house, the mission is to be authentic followers of Jesus. And authentic followers of Jesus are people who act with compassion. Amen? Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, would you move in us so deeply that it causes us to act? God, I pray that we would not be able to finish our day without seeing somebody in need. And Lord, would you give us eyes to see what you're trying to do? God, I pray for ministry opportunities and that you'd slow us down enough to see your hand in them. And Lord, I pray that you would give us a heart that is big enough to act. Give us the courage to see things differently and the irresistible urge to respond to the things that we see. God, would you help us to show both love and compassion to our friends and even our enemies. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.